and I just wanted to welcome all our wonderful community members who are joining us here today and most especially uh, Professor Olga Lovanyuk who is joining us for the second time. Um, Professor Lovanyuk joins us actually with our first video that we did for Hour 25 many months ago. Um, we've had so many beautiful conversations uh, and events since then but it's such a joy and delight to welcome you back Olga today so we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you Claudia. Yeah, so today we were th hoping to talk about Penelope weaving. That was sort of the topic that we were thinking we would discuss. And, um, and ahead of time, we shared with some members of our community some passages, some focus passages in the Odyssey, uh, one from Scroll 2, one from Scroll 19, and another from Scroll 24 that really focus on um, moments where we get descriptions of Penelope weaving. And so we're hoping to just talk about weaving and Penelope in general. We have some questions from the community. Uh, we're going to take some time to actually read those passages together and then just, you know, answer questions or any concerns that come up for us as we talk about this. And as always, um, Olga, we're delighted to hear your thoughts or anything that comes up for you as we're reading or anything, you know, maybe if you want to share just a few words about Penelope now, that's fine. If not, we can just jump right into reading. Um, I, you know, I think it's such a large topic that it might yeah. actually be better to go right into weaving because I'm afraid that if I start talking yeah, about weaving, yeah. I will never end. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. You know, we yeah. get, we might get, you know, not, you know, it's it's like a starting a, a fabric kim. There are so many ways you could go. Right. And, uh, I think I think if, if people start asking questions and sharing their thoughts, maybe. I can, that maybe we can go the way we should go. Okay. Great. So I'm going to turn now to our members of the community who are in what we call Hollywood Squares, affectionately, very affectionately. Um, and so I'll ask if anyone has a question to start off or if someone would like to volunteer to read. The first passage would be Odyssey 2, lines 85, 85 through 128. Would anyone like to have a question or start with that reading? Bill. Uh, I'll read or I got a question. Which one do you want? Oh, okay. So actually, it, okay, why don't you, let, why, let's read first. How about that? And then we'll go with the question. Okay. Telemachus, insolent braggart that you are, how dare you try to throw the blame upon us suitors? We are not the ones who are responsible for your mother. Your mother is. For she knows many kinds of craftiness. This three years past and close on four, she's been driving us out of our minds by encouraging each one of us and sending him messages that say one thing about say one thing, but her mind means other things. And then there was that other trick she played on us. She set up a great timbre frame in her room and began to work on an enormous piece of fine fabric. Sweethearts, she said, great Odysseus is indeed dead. Still, do not press me to marry again immediately. Wait, for I would not have skill in, have skill in weaving perish unrecorded till I have completed a shroud for the hero letter. Laertes, to be in readiness against the time when death shall take him. He is very rich, and the women of the district will talk if he is laid out without a shroud. This is what she said, and we assented. Whereon we could see her working on her great web all day long. But at night, she would unpick the stitches again by torchlight. She fooled us in this way for three years, and we never found her out. But as time wore on, she and she was now in the fourth year, one of her maids who knew what she was doing told us, and we caught her in the act of undoing her work. So she had to finish it, whether she would or no. The suitors, therefore, make you this answer, that both you and the Achaeans may understand. Send your mother away, and bid her marry the man of her own and of her father's choice. For I do not know what will happen if she goes on plaguing us much longer with errors she gives herself on the score of the accomplishments Athena has taught her. And because she knows so many kinds of kurdos, we, we never yet heard of such a woman we know all about, Tyro, Al, uh, Alchemine, Messina, wearer of garlands, and the famous women of old. But they were nothing to your mother, any one of them. It was not fair of her to treat us in this way, and as long as she continues in the mind with which the gods have endowed her so long we shall go on eating up your estate. And I do not see why she should change, for she gets all the honors and glory, and it is you who pay for it, not she. 
Understand then that we will not go back to our lands, neither here nor elsewhere, till she has made her choice or married someone or other of us. Thanks, Bill. That was beautiful. And, you know, that's actually the longest passage we've ever read together. Okay, that's a long one, um, but there's a lot, in, and there's a lot going on there. And um, just so that other people who are joining us in the audience know, our other passages are going to be Odyssey 19, 124 through 158. And then Odyssey 24, 120 through 148, and they're very similar passages. Okay, we're going to get a lot of repetition. There's some key differences, and we can talk about those later. But just as a heads up, so Bill, now that you've done all that reading, um, what's your question, or what's coming up for you in your reading? Um, Olga, maybe you can answer it. I don't know. Maybe somebody else can. My question is about the word stitches. Mm. Thinking of weaving, it seems to me that in the night she should have been unraveling what she'd done the day before. But stitches, to me, implies embroidery work. Yes, and in fact, I think it's a, it's a, basically it's a fault of translation. And I have to refer here to um, Greg's beautiful, Greg Nara's beautiful work on um, what exactly the word "hufino" means, uh, and um, his argument that it means, uh, first of all based on even earlier scholarship, not embroidery, definitely not embroidery, but weaving, and then specifically pattern weaving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Penelope is doing. And the verb for undoing the stitching is actually the verb that means more um, dissolving. So it's really, it's not picking out something, but the fabric remains intact. The meaning is very different. It's dissolution of the fabric. That's what the verb in the original uh, Greek convey so it's very you you put your finger on a you know a, a big problem in translation. Thank maybe, you. Maybe it can be corrected in in later in later editions. But that's exactly what she is doing is very much what Andromache is doing um, in um, Iliad 22 and what Helen is doing in Iliad 3. All of this um, women in Homer are engaged in the craft of pattern weaving. Mm. I is it okay. Go oh ahead. yeah, yeah. Yes, oh. we're, we're going to have an informal discussion back and forth. Okay. Great. Well, because uh, Olga, you mentioned the word dissolving, and that was one of my questions. Was it really is for me? Reminds me of the phases of the moon, so that they're building up a pattern. It becomes a full moon, and then she starts to unravel, and between, and and that brings me. And then I, I, th I think I also try to make it an analogy of the chariot wheel and all this ring cycle, um, you know, events going on. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were about that. All three questions. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, um, so I haven't worked on that quite specifically. But um, I, uh, and so it's, it, and it's hard to deal with subject like that, whereas there are sort of lots of associations that, that are all all floating around you, and you don't know which thread to follow to stay with to stay with our weaving uh, metaphor. But um, there is definitely well. First of all, when we get to book twenty-four, you'll see that when she completes the fabric, the fabric is splendid and shining, and it's called like sun and moon. Right. It's similar in in the, in the result is similar to sun and moon, um, and there has been there have been some people who suggested that it might actually have to do with a sort of coincidence of cycles that you see in the return of Odysseus. And however we want to think about it, you know, whether whether we can work out the details precisely, whereas in fact anybody could work out the details precisely. Um, there is definitely a, a sense of no, the turning of the year, the turning of the seasons, the return of the sun that is happening when Odysseus comes back. We get language of spring, we get a lot of reference to the seasons, uh, and his whole journey, I think, is in some ways metaphorically pictured as, um, you know, on, on the model of a solar journey, journey where the sun goes into the underworld um, and is absent and then is reborn, mm -hmm. comes, comes mm -hmm. back. And so that is definitely that is definitely happening. It's harder to tie it directly to Penelope's weaving and unweaving because there is oh, no, there is no 
I have to I have to leave. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, Jackie was squeezing us in. She she was so excited to speak with you and to um to get in a question, but she had another commitment um, at her house, an emergency, actually a plumbing emergency. So. Well, I'll, 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 I'll continue my thought. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't know whether we can tie it to Penelope's weaving and then weaving directly because the times don't al align perfectly. Uh, but the general, um, in general, I, I certainly agree with, with Jackie that, um, that there is this you know, importance of time and seasonality. And even just the very day when uh, Odysseus comes back, that it is the the um, festival of Apollo, and that we are told many times that he comes at the conclusion of this period that is known as Lucabas, and there are a lot of discussions about what that what that is. Um, you know, that is certainly that is certainly present. Mm. So that's uh, super interesting, right? Because I feel like we're getting this um, this passage about delay. Mm -hmm. And then yet there's this inherent issue of seasonality and timeliness and that, that you're pointing us towards, right? Yes, and actually I think that it's, uh, it's, um, it may be we can uh, even think about a different kind of connection between delay and coincidence and seasonality, which I think also has to do with partly with Penelope's weaving, but also with Penelope's plotting. Mm. You asked me a question about Penelope being metaphorical or literal um, we were we were of wiles as opposed to we were of class mm -hmm. uh, because, and it's a very interesting thing actually because normally in even though in Homer um, women women pri primarily weave uh, when weaving is used metaphorically which it often is um, of weaving of tricks this is done by men. So the literal weaving is done by women, but the metaphorical women is done or as a winding up of threads. It's done by men. Oh, how fascinating. Penelope, except for Penelope. Penelope does both. Hmm. So she winds, winds up her, uh, her threads literally, and she winds up her threads metaphorically. And I think that, in, um, in fact, make an argument about, for that in, in my book that she is a little, she is, that she is in some way sort of plotting and authoring the Odyssey as actively as Odysseus does, because she uses this verb tolipeo, which literally means to wind a, a thread around a, a, a spool, uh, which Agamemnon uses about accomplishing something. You know, you she completed his task, his mm -hmm. work. And look what she got. What he got as a as a reward. Of course, he got killed mm -hmm. by. But Penelope, Penelope, when Odysseus comes and talks to her in disguise in Book 19, says, "I've completed my I I complete my wiles," and she uses the same verb that I am winding up my tricks. And he says, "This is what this is what I did. This was my trick. This this uh, shroud for Laertes, and now I've finished it." Mm -hmm. Where you know, I think in a sense, it, it's a way of telling Odysseus, you know, well, I've done my part, and here we are, and now you should arrive. Right. Now, now it's time for you. Now it's time for you to come. So she is, she is in some way, of course, Odysseus is following this narrative pattern, this traditional pattern of you know a hero arriving in the nick of time. Right. But in the Odyssey, the, the wife who is being saved in the nick of time is not a passive wife who is just being saved in the week of time, in the nick of time, but who in fact has been sort of enabling and plotting her own salvation, and who determines where this, you know, where is the right, when the right moment will be. Okay, so you're saying it's not even that she is timely herself; she is actively creating that moment, yes. that timeliness. Exactly wow. what I'm saying, yes. How beautiful. And now, so I should just give some people a more context in terms of your approach, Olga, which is that you study not only this narrative uh, in which there's a hero and a husband returning in disguise to a wife, but also you've looked at this kind of narrative in other traditions, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So like in Slavic literature, for instance, South Slavic literature. Slavic and in Turkic and in Indic and um, 
And I think that you know, Penelope knows very well the traditional narrative. <laughs> <laughs> she is the heroine. But what she also does is become the author as well as the heroine of yeah. this story. It's amazing. So, okay, so I, I'm going to invite everyone now who's in Hollywood Squares to, you know, turn off their mute signal and just join the conversation whenever they're ready, if they have questions or if there's something that's jumping out of these passages. I think I never got to ask his question. How about Jenna? Jenna, do you have a question? I do, but Bill, did you want to, did you ask your question? Are you? Oh, I thought you did. Okay, no, 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 so sorry. Go ahead, Jenna. Okay. Um, my question is a little bit more about the wording that's used as well. Um, I was interested in this word, nema, which I guess is from what I can find is the word for thread or yarn maybe. And um, it's not used very frequently in um, Homeric poetry or um, early Greek epic. Um, I only find it four times in the Odyssey, and um, but I've seen that it's in the um, works and days, the Hesiodic works and days, in relationship to spider's thread. And I was wondering if there was something that you could expand on about that kind of similarity between spider's thread and what what Penelope is using in her weaving. Yes, well, it's uh, because this word is not very frequent, that's why it's hard, in a sense, to comment on, on it. Um, it's hard to determine the poetic associations when it's only used a few times. Um, what I can tell you is there is a distinction between, you know, thread as part of a fabric or thread as um, material, something you can use to tie a package. And Nema is specifically a thread as it is being pulled out, you know, as it, as it is being spun. It comes from the verb that, that, mean, that means to spin. And I think that's where the similarity with the spider comes, because it's a thread as it's becoming a thread, as it's emerging. I don't know exactly what, you know, what we can do with that. Yes. Um, but yes, it, it's used, is used in this, in this passage. And the, um, on a very different note, it's, it's interesting to me that Penelope is talking here about the sort of raw material of weaving, which never, which never seems to um, be mentioned when we talk about uh, um, aristocratic women doing their doing their work. Um, it, and sometimes I think this um, is it with Helen that her thread is called sort of you know shining or or splendid. Um, and I wonder where, when and Penelope, Penelope says it here in a strange, strange way. She she says, um, you know, wait, wait with pressing me about my marriage until I finish this uh, shroud for Laertes. And then she says, um, so that my yarn doesn't go to waste. Basically, it doesn't remain in in vain. And I think that it's. Um, no, there is a kind of double edge to this message. We haven't, I, I myself personally haven't come to the, to the end of it. Because in some ways she's sort of playing the role of a poor widow. It makes me think of the simile in, in um, Odyssey, uh, in Odyssey, in Iliad 12, and there is, when there is a poor widow who is weighing the wool on two cups of a balance, and she has to be very precise, and she weighs the exact amount to work for her meager, um, you know, meager fee. So, Penelope is sort of saying, well, you know, I'm a widow, I don't have a provider in, any longer, I can't, I can't let my thread go to waste. Um, and at the same time, you know, her threads are so powerful and she's such a powerful figure that there is a sort of very, you know, you know she's going to catch them in, that, in those threads. <laughs> you know, it's, they're not going to go to waste, they're definitely not going to be wasted, and that I think is a, is, is a, is a subtext. I wonder if, if in maybe this has just made me think that somehow it relates to she doesn't want her thread to go to waste because, like the spider, she's kind of created it in a way, which is what you're saying. She's creating her, her story here as well. So it, there is maybe some meta, metaphorical level to this as well where she's, um, she's 
thinking about her raw material because her raw material is her craftiness as well, yeah. in a way. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And she definitely drops the suitors. <laughs> <laughs> she does. <laughs> Right. And I'm wondering about the way that she herself, I mean, this is going to sound horrible, but I mean, in this society, women are a kind of transferable property in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I mean, she, if she is waiting and not marrying, she's not being sort of utilized to fulfillment in that sense. I mean, does that sound, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in a way, do you know what I mean? Like, I wonder to what extent there's a sense of, um, like I think there's a beautiful simile, I think it's in the Iliad, um, when Menelaus gets injured, and mm -hmm. his, I think it's his thigh, yeah. and there's blood running down his thigh, okay, and suddenly you get this incredible simile which it says, and it was read like the cheek pieces for a horse's bridle, I think, yeah. right. that are sort of hidden away in this, in this very rich person's sort of vault, right, in their treasure room, and basically aren't getting used, right, and so here's Penelope, she's, a, this is the most amazing woman, and yet somehow she's not in circulation yet the way she should be, or she's not, you know what I mean? There's something yeah. I wonder. And, and in, in it, you know, in a sense, although I've never, I've never you know, I've never uh, thought of it, about it in this way, it's true, she refuses, of course, to, to re-enter circulation, which all of these young men would like to do, uh, well, like her to do, um, but you know that that this is actually how Greek language in general, especially Athenian or especially in Athens and classical Athens, talks about betrothal. Um, that when a woman is betrothed, the word for that is engue, which literally means putting putting away in a vault. You could have translated mm -hmm. this. So she is. She might not be married yet to somebody, but she is not free yet for circulation any longer. She is like a treasure stored in an underground vault, and then she is going to emerge all resplendent on the day of her wedding and be handed over to the person mm -hmm. for whom she has. She is being saved. So it's sort of that moment of anticipation. She's still in that, and she's yeah. creating the perfect moment to step out. Is what you're maybe hinting us towards? All right. So she is saving herself for Odysseus because right. Uh, when the, when the right husband shows up. Because, because okay. all those other husbands are not worthy. Yeah. So Jessica actually had a question. I know um, Bill had a question. So Bill, why don't you... Okay. Bill, would you like uh, to go and then we'll have a question from Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, that whole discussion we just had about Penelope's attitude towards the weaving, I took a totally different take on it. Uh-huh. Uh, when she says, I would not have skill in weaving perish unrecorded, you know, this is her moment. This is her unfailing glory, that this the shroud she's about to make. And I took it to mean that she had this gift and she wanted to have it uh, memorialized for all time. And what kind of brought that to mind is later on, uh, this one of the suitors complains. She gives herself errors on the score of the accomplishments Athena has taught her, which you know that would be weaving. Uh, so I just took it to mean that she had a great skill and she wanted to demonstrate it and have it there before she moved on with the rest of her life. Well, you know, I take it that way too. I just, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a statement that means all these things simultaneously. You know, on some surface level it says, uh, and, you know, she's always playing this poor widow role, you know, I'm not going to waste my wool and how can Laertes be left without a shroud? On another level it's saying, um, I'm going to I'm going to trap you. On another level, it's saying I'm going to have my song. I'm going to have my Cleos. Um, saying all the things simultaneously, I think that's sort of to me to me that's the beauty of it. And in fact, I think this is, in a sense, you know, in some sense, it is her song. And she there are many signs in this passage and in Book 19 and in Book 24 that it is um, her Cleos. And I actually have also sort of talked about it before before in, in, in print, that even uh, Antinous here in book two, in the passage that you just read, who is not trying to give Penelope you know, her, her song, who is actually trying to you know, criticize her and, and say how bad it is for, for Telemachus, nevertheless is sort of almost against his will led into this really strange position where he gets this really ambiguous statement 
Okay, so on the one hand, uh, blames her for tricking them. On the other hand, says, well, there's never been a woman as clever as this. Not uh, not Turo, not Alcmini. None, none of them have done it. He, he knows, his statement acknowledges that this story that he just told about the loom, which he is telling as, you know, look how, how bad Penelope behaves, that story is actually praised by everybody else, right? This story is, is and, and, and he senses that in his, very, in his very statement, and then he sort of tries to uh, resolve this by saying, well, it might be good for her, Telemachus, but it's not good for you. Right. So it's no. must but, it comes at, but it comes at your expense. Um, and that is a you know and that is a big dilemma for Telemachus. But of course, in the in the long run, Telemachus and Penelope both know that it comes at Telemachus' expect, expense in the short run, maybe, but not in the long run. Thank you. Yeah. So this is definitely this is this is definitely her Cleos. Yes. And so Jessica, who needs to remain on mute because there's construction um, in the background, and I also have construction at my house too. It's a crazy day. So, um, so she wants us to sort of saying, or, is, or is, are her methods a way for her to keep her autonomy, right, Jessica? And then also she's wondering if you could comment on the fact that we don't know exactly what Penelope wove or uh, or stitch, but we do know that Helen. Uh, in Iliad 3, or lines 1, 25 through 8, we use the stories of the battles fought for her. Um, so uh, uh, perhaps you could just comment a little bit about that difference. Oh, okay. So, but what was the first question? Oh, yeah, about, you know, are, are these a way for her, uh, are her methods a way for her to keep her autonomy? It's interesting that you should say that. It's a very, um, it's a very good observation because, in fact, there has been some work on on the word for loom, which is histos, which just means standing pole, you know, a, a, a big vertical. And it means loom, and the same exact word also means a mast, like a mast of a, of a, of a boat, of a ship. And um, it seems that both of them are used for, essentially, you know, they, they're gendered words. So it's the same word. But it can be differently gendered, and it serves as a demarcator of a male sphere versus female sphere. There is some very interesting work on that. That when you set up your loom, you are saying, "This is my territory." Hmm. And so it's analogous to a man setting up the the mass because that is literally they'll take it and set it up, right? Exactly, and that in both passages says that you know they they specify that she set up. A big loom, and you know scholars have uh, puzzled over that because you know she must have had loom. Hamelic women always weave. She must already have a room in a loom in her <laughs> uh, room. Why does she? Um, why does she have to set it up again? But it says not just you know she that she set up the loom that it was big and that it was in her halls in the sort of the official name for the house, not not somewhere, in, but to specify that in the gray in the grand house of Odysseus, she set up a big loom, which I I think is definitely a discourse of both gender and territoriality of autonomy. Um, you cannot the students cannot come here. They it's her it's her position while this loom is standing there. Wow, that is beautiful and fascinating. And it's so interesting that you would pick up on that. And Janet, is it Janet? The Janet? Uh, Jessica, Jessica, yes. yes. Jessica so for me, I know sometimes the order changes in Hollywood Squares. For me, Jessica is uh, second from the left, so maybe Jessica can just okay. wait. Uh, yeah, there she is, Jessica. She's amazing. That's a beautiful question. Yeah, thank you. So, how about other people? I mean, should we move on to some of the different passages? Unless Kimmy, do you have anything that's jumping out for you from this passage? Uh, no, okay. the second one, 19. Okay, shall we go to that? Okay. Um, is well, there anyone? I yeah. never said anything about Helen. Do you want me to say something about it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. We will move on to book 19. I think um, it would be beautiful if you could say something about what the fact that we know what Helen was weaving. Uh, just a few words. Well, we don't know what Penelope was weaving, of course. We don't know what the pattern was. Um, and 
Um, and we also know that, um, but we know about we know about Helen, and we also know something about the color, the color of your um, fabric. And there is actually a textual variant there, and one of them says that it was purple, and another one says that it was shining. And mm -hmm. um, and Greg Nash did, has a beautiful explanation of that in, in um, one of his books. Um, I think there is, there, is, there is similarity in the sense that, that um, Helen has reflected her life, and maybe this purple is actually sort of the color of shed blood that is that is being shed in Troy for her for her sake. Um, and it's interesting that Penelope that we are not told we are not told what the uh, what Penelope is the picture is remains remains mysterious. And we are also told about uh, what Andromache does with the flowers. And again, um, there is purple color there. Um, so this is a notable absence. Is, is that what you're trying to? And I think that in some ways, um, you know, this fabric also, unlike um, Helen's fabric and and Andromache's fabric, this fabric undergoes an interesting transformation that the other two don't. Um, the um, Penelope starts weaving it when she says that it's a shroud for Laertes. Um, but in the end, I think it is actually it actually becomes a sort of a wedding cloak, a wedding fabric for Penelope and Odysseus. Mm. So what does it depict? You know how what it's all we know is that it's shining like the the sun and moon, but it has a sort of mysterious quality where it's almost as if we can't tell what what is on it because you know it's it, it's woven and unwoven and is the same pattern or is it the same pattern all the time or is she telling a different story the last time that she weaves um, this is all you know it's all left to our imaginations mm. well I mean for me that makes me think about the ways that we talked about lament in the Heroes X project where, and I think this is something we touched upon in our earlier conversation um, at Hour 25 all those months ago, which is this relationship in love, with love stories, right? Um, mm -hmm. This sort of mingling between the themes of the desirable uh, young hero who dies early, um, and these, these minglings of the theme of death and, um, and love, right? So that certain themes that are present in our... Um, that are present in the tradition, in context, would determine whether they were a love song or whether they were a lament, right? Yes, and it's exactly like yes. that. Sort of the fabric that is reinterpreted okay. from a from a dance fabric or right. re 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 reverse fabric, something like yeah. that. And so now, actually, uh, I just want to introduce uh, Georgios, who is um, has been an active member of. Uh, of our Hangouts, actually, through Q&A, and he's joining us today. Georgios, I'm sorry we had some technical problems earlier today. I'm so glad you can join us. Um, I'm happy to introduce Hi, you. Hi, I'm sorry, Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I am Georgios Piliotopoulos, uh, and you have warm greetings from Greece, Athens. Oh, thank and, you. Um, yes, uh, I am a postgraduate student in ancient Greek uh, language and literature. And um, I love to be with you today. I am really sorry for being late because I have mm. technical problems. Yes. And um, so, uh, well, we're so I'm really glad being with you. So you're, we're so glad you joined us. So what we've done so far is we've just talked about the first focus passage in case other people are just joining us for the first time. Um, we've been talking most recently about maybe uh, thoughts about what, what might actually be in this weaving. And we've been thinking about... Um, maybe what we know about other weavings that we hear about in Homeric literature that we might know a little bit more details about, sort of tantalizing. Um, and so um, Kimmy has actually put a question in our chat bar. Olga, do you know how to use the chat feature in Google Plus? If yes. you go over to the left-hand side? Yeah, I can actually kind of condense it. It's pretty long, actually. But I had a question about Book 19. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, from the focus strategies, it seems like um, Penelope is very much like Odysseus, very crafty, very intelligent, has lots of, um, I shouldn't say tricks, up her sleeve. And uh, Hasuda said that she, she would say things to make them think one way, but actually have different thoughts in her mind. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty much similar to what Achilles said about Odysseus. Yes. That he has, you know, like I hate like gates of hell who talks one thing but had something else in his mind. And I was thinking those two people are very alike and they're crafty, very intelligent, have no cautious not easy to disclose what they think or feel. And yet he meets this beggar and she's right away telling him about the tricks he played on her suitors about weaving. Mm -hmm. And then she goes on to tell him about the dream she had. Mm. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was pretty transparent kind of symbolic dream. And I was starting to think that no, Penelope knows she's talking to Odysseus, although he's in disguise. And they are playing this du dual uh, dance type of, like, of a game, each trying to sort of get information from each other, testing each other, or whatever. And that was the impression I was beginning to have. And I was wondering how you feel about it. Well, interesting. Um, Kimi, you are not going to get any any pushback on this from me. <laughs> I stuck out my neck long ago uh, oh, on exactly that question. It's not, I might, I must say, the most prevalent opinion in modern scholarship, but certainly my my opinion. Um, okay. That the, and I think you, you know, I think you're absolutely right. It is, uh, you know, and and the, the way people sometimes explain it and they say, well, Penelope consciously doesn't know it's Odysseus, um, mm -hmm. but somehow subconsciously she either recognized him or fell in love with him and subcon and that's why she is telling him the dream and confessing to him her um, you know, innermost most feelings, which, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think that's what our text justifies I, and, and, and I do agree with you that it isn't very peripheral, it's not very circumspect of Penelope to suddenly mm -hmm. open oh, no. like this to, you know, to yet another beggar who comes into her house. Uh, so I think I think this whole conversation, in fact, I see it as a coded dialogue between two masters of mm -hmm. what you say, indirect speech, indirect mm -hmm. communication, saying one thing and meaning another and indicated, mm -hmm. indicating it in a veiled way and reading such messages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Testing, understanding signs. They, mm -hmm. These are two masters of this, and this is one of the way that I don't think so much that Penelope recognizes Odysseus. I, I think she, I think her um, guess is this is Odysseus, but I don't think it's because she sort of looked at him and so you know and thought, oh, you know, he's kind of similar. Although you know, Euripides does say that. But I don't think that's how that's what's at, at, what the point is. I think it's rather Odysseus comes, and there are mm -hmm. signs that Odysseus might be around, and then this person mm -hmm. comes and in a veiled way makes a claim to her, mm -hmm. lets her know, I am mm -hmm. Odysseus, and she understands it and she tests mm -hmm. it and she mm -hmm. believes it. She said she, she recognized the mind, yeah, the he, mind he, of Odysseus. She yeah. recognized. And he recognized her, and yes. that there. Yeah. And so, and then she, you know, okay, maybe there are all these gods, as she says herself, who can trick you. But mm -hmm. her best hypothesis is that this is Odysseus, and she mm -hmm. then proceeds to act on that hypothesis when she stages the bow conversation. And so I think that over the book nineteen, we progress mm -hmm. from the first mm -hmm. meeting of them and Penelope melting in tears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very early mm -hmm. on in the conversation, before any signs, before she received the, um, you know, all the subsequent subsequent proofs, mm -hmm. uh, 
in the first 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 half of it, and mm -hmm. then first part of it. We progress from that to Penelope mm -hmm. saying, "I'm going to stage the ball competition on the next day," and Odysseus mm -hmm. saying, "Yes, mm -hmm. good plan." Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Do you think he made up that dream? Do you think he really dreamt it, or do you think he made it up? Uh, the short answer or a long? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, Georgia. Yes, please, please, please. Yes. I said, I say, I say yes. What I, uh, what I would add a footnote is to the words made up. So I okay. think the theme is a performance of a particular kind. I don't okay. think it's a report okay. of your okay. dream. You know, I, 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 I would hesitate to use those words made up, or at least I would have to qualify the meaning in some way. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you know, it's the only dream in Homer, it's the mm -hmm. only one in Homer that we are not told by the poet's voice that, mm -hmm. the, um, that the person actually saw the dream. Well, there is mm -hmm. another one, but that one we know is a creation. In fact, Odysseus, mm -hmm. Odysseus makes this, mm -hmm. this, you know, tells a story about this, this mm -hmm. dream to deceive somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the only parallel we have for not mm -hmm. for not being told that, the, but also where did when did she see this dream? When you know it's uh, just now by coincidence the dream came. You know I I think it's uh, it's a performance based on a long old song tradition in which a bride a bride to be sees a prophetic dream on the eve of her marriage. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I remember. I remember reading another one like that. I think there was something about. Yeah. Okay. I have to build my memory. Thank that's, you very much. Yeah, that's so beautiful, right? When we look at these things in a larger context, suddenly we see new patterns, mm -hmm. right? And so we mm -hmm. see even this one moment that looks so unusual and striking can be. I think what you're saying is traditional in many ways. It's mm -hmm. traditional in many ways. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, Georgios, I know we're we're at the very end here. So, Olga, can, um, do we maybe have four minutes to go over, or or are we up against a tight deadline? I could go over a little bit. Okay, great. Georgios, do you have a question or a comment that you're thinking about these passages? Yes, I would like to ask. Uh, I would like to ask uh, something. Um, uh, if we have a, a formula, a large type of formula that is repeated over and over again, when uh, Penelope uh, describes um, the making of uh, uh, her weaving. Uh, yeah. I eleven um, eleven verses repeated, and uh, I would like, uh, dear professor, to make a comment about that. If we have a large type of formula and uh, its uh, its meaning here. Um. Yeah. Well. You know, it's not. It's um, as uh, as um, you know, as as Albert Lord said. It's all traditional. You know, and in some ways you could say that it's all formulaic. It's not that unusual for such pa such large repetitions to to occur in Homer. And I think part of the reason why actually this is repeated so exactly in the three places, and then and then well, I don't not say why, but I, I can. Um, and maybe, maybe we would have to, you know, ask me a more precise question so I can know what comment to make. But the comment I'm going to make initially is that um, it, it is the same song, right? It's Penelope's calling card, if you will. Right? This is her. This is her narrative, and these core verses, the core eleven verses, are repeated exactly. But there are other detail, details around them that are not repeated exactly. <laughs> And, and the meaning of this song changes subtly depending on the context. We looked at it in book two, where it was Antinous in his hostile telling, and he tried to do it hostile in hostile telling, but the song sort of gets away from him, and he ends up giving Penelope her Cleos, her glory, even though he is trying to do something else. In book 19, there is another telling by Penelope herself, which acquires a different meaning and context, and we can go into more details about it. And in book 24, it acquires yet another meaning. 
So what's very interesting to me is that we have this sort of illustration of, of how traditional poetry works. That, yes, there are the same lines, and there are small changes, small variations, but even this relatively small variations and change of context, you can, you can, you can have, to, you can get to see how the um, continuity and fluidity and variation works in performance. My, am I answering your question at all? Or yes, yes. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, the significant thing here is that uh, we have the same verses, but uh, with a different. Um, could say this is um, the magic formula, I think. Um, I, I don't know if you hear me uh, properly. Yeah, it's a little hard to hear. The magic formula, you say? Is that what you said? Yeah. No, this is the magic of formulas that yeah. they, they can be used uh, several pa several passages with a different meaning. Yes, this is absolutely. What I absolutely, and that's exactly exactly what happens. So yes. this is I think that's actually very beautiful that it's the, that it's this sort of this um, verses that are so central and that are so stable. This is Penelope's song, and yet it has completely different meaning in the three passages. Yeah. That's so beautiful, and that in many ways, yeah, that in many ways takes us back to what we were saying about the fabric itself and and our. Um, and the things we don't know about it, right? The way that whatever it is, it's hard to see, right? I think about Anna Bonifazi's argument about Homer's Versi colored fabric. Versi colored um, fabric, yes. That, you know, you look from one angle and you see one color, and you look from another angle and you see another color, right? Right. Or, yeah. yes. Well, Olga, thank you so much. I mean, again, we, it's so unbelievable, right? We really only scratched the surface for these it's passages. Totally Surface, yes. Yes, so I'm glad. Um, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to read these lines with you and with everyone here in this community. Um, uh, I'm so thankful everyone took the time of their day to come and listen to this, especially at 11 a.m. on the East Coast where we're opposite the soccer game, the U.S. soccer game. So we're very appreciative of that. I mean, these people are really committed here. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Well, that was, it was a joy. It was a joy to talk to you. Yes, and so hopefully uh, we can have a future conversation again, and um, we look forward to reading your work and following uh, all your beautiful ideas in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye.